Hi everyone, um, I hope you can hear me all all right. So um, just starting today's webinar for the hospitality industry. So my name is Ravina Purawal and I'm an environmental health practitioner and I work within the RSP and um, my colleagues Helen Clark who's the commercial services manager and Anthony Hawke who's a principal licensing officer um, are on the call are on the webinar today. So I'll be going for the slides but they'll be here for the question and answer session at the end. So just to go for a quick welcome. So again, welcome to the event. Um, we have a host of council officers here to answer your questions today. Please note this event is being recorded and will be published after on the council's website, on each council's website in each borough. Um, all attendees other than the panel are muted at the moment. And after the initial presentation, we will give you an opportunity to ask these questions, to ask questions. If you, if you wish to ask questions, please use the virtual hand. When I say your name, a member of the event team will unmute you. If you do speak, it will be good for you to turn on your camera. And um, throughout, the, throughout the, my presentation, please use the chat function to share your views. And I'll try and bring this in at the question and answer session at the end. Um, all attendees have been sent event etiquette, reminding them of the need to be respect, respect, respectful of all speakers. We're sure we won't, need to, we won't need to, but if we do need to mute or remove participants, the event staff will do so. If there are any problems, we will communicate with individuals via the chat or by inviting them into an adjoining virtual discussion. After the event, attendees will be emailed any relevant links or information shared at the event, including copies of the presentation. So just a bit about the RSP. So the RSP is the Regulatory Services Partnership and it provides the environmental health function for the London boroughs of Merton, Richmond and Wandsworth. And we cover areas such as food hygiene, food standards, health and safety, licensing, pollution, trading standards. And now we're doing a lot of work around COVID-19. And a part of that work is webinars like this and supporting businesses with the guidance and legislation in place to control the transmission of COVID-19, which is what I'll be talking about now. So just a quick overview of the webinar. I'll start by talking about risk assessments and COVID-19 control measures, such as ventilation, face coverings and social distancing. I'll be talking about supporting the NHS test and trace response, um, in particular the requirement to display NHS QR codes. And then talking about COVID-19 testing, and then going on to step two of the roadmap. So what can we do from the 12th of April, 2021? As what can hospitality businesses? And then briefly covering step three of the roadmap, but guidance on this is quite limited at the moment. And then finally, the question and answer session. I don't anticipate talking for more than 30, 40 minutes, um, so then leaving plenty of time for the question and answers. So this is just a, um, this is just a, slide referring to all the links in the presentation so you can access it when you're viewing afterwards. Um, so before I start talking about the control measures I thought it'd be good to quickly cover um, how the virus is transmitted. So an infected, the virus can spread from an infected person's mouth or nose in small liquid particles when they cough, sneeze, speak, sing or breathe heavily. These liquid particles are different sizes ranging from larger respiratory droplets to smaller aerosols. These respiratory droplets and aerosols will then get into another person's mouth, nose or eyes and they then catch COVID-19. This is much more likely to happen when people are in direct or close contact with each other. Another but less common way of the virus being transmitted is when an infected person sneezes, coughs or touches surfaces or objects such as tables, doorknobs door and handrails and another person then touches that contaminated surface and then touches their eyes, nose or mouth without first having cleaned their hands. Um, so there's a link to the WHO website there if you want to read more about that. Um, so risk assessments, so I've gone a bit step too far. So risk assessments, so as an employer, you have a legal responsibility to protect workers from the risks to their health and safety. This includes the risks, the risks posed by COVID-19. COVID-19 is a workplace hazard and should be managed in the workplace the same as other hazards, such as just like you manage slips, trips and falls, working at height or anything similar, you should be managing COVID-19 in the same way. This includes completing a suitable and sufficient assessment of the risks posed by COVID-19, so completing a COVID-19 risk assessment. If you have more than five employees, you must record the findings of your risk assessment. 
if you have fewer than five employees, there's no legal requirement for you to record your findings, but you might find it helpful to do so. There's a lot of guidance on the Health and Safety Executive website um, on how to complete a risk assessment. And there's also on the Merton Council website links to a template risk assessment, which you may need to use and various other resources. Um, so this is a this is a document on the Health and Safety Executive website, which is titled What to Include in Your Risk Assessment. And I think this is really helpful. Um, I've just cop copied a segment um, from this document. So you'd need to do this about all the various hazards, but this hazard talks about getting or spreading coronavirus by not washing your hands or not washing them adequately. So then it talks about who might be harmed, so workers, customers, etc. And then it talks about what control measures. So what are you doing to make sure people are washing their hands and washing them adequately? So then it talks about providing water, soap and hygienic hand drying facilities at wash stations, making sure you have a sufficient number of wash, wash hand basins and providing hand sanitizer on occasions where people can't wash their hands. And then the final section is what are you doing um, to what are you what are you doing what further action do you need to control the risks so that might include something like every morning checking that you've got soap and your sanitizer dispensers are filled dispensers are filled um so this is just a segment the actual full document provides you a lot more detail um next slide so this talks about ventilation and fresh air so ventilation should be used as a control measure to reduce the risk of aerosol transmission of covid-19 I cannot stress the importance of having a, of having ventilation as a control measure. So there's two main ways of providing ventilation. So the first way is natural ventilation. This relies on passive airflow through windows, doors and air vents. So you should be keeping the windows, doors and air vents open at all times. Even if it's cold outside, they still need to stay open. So you're bringing in fresh air from the outside, from outside and then mechanical ventilation. So this would mean using ventilation systems to bring in fresh air from outside. So you might need to look at your, um, look at the, the specs of your ventilation systems to make sure they're bringing fresh air from outside. Some air conditioning units, or well, most air conditioning units, recirculate air, which is not what we're trying to do here, that we wanna bring in fresh air from outside. So if your air conditioning unit is recirculating air, this alone is not providing ventilation, you should be using that alongside um, bringing in the fresh air supply. So using your air conditioning unit alongside another ventilation system, which is bringing in fresh air or alongside having your windows and doors and air vents open. And when you're thinking about ventilating your premises, think of all areas of the premises, not just where your customers are sitting, but also toilets and staff rooms. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot of guidance again on the health and safety executive website on ventilation and air conditioning. Um, and next is, is face coverings. We've had a lot of queries. Do I still need to wear a face covering? Do my customers still need to wear a face covering? So this for now is in terms of customers. Unless exempt, customers must wear a face covering by law in various indoor settings in England. And one of these indoor settings are premises providing hospitality, such as bars, pubs, restaurants and cafes, except when seated at a table. As a business, you should take reasonable steps to encourage customer compliance for example, through in-store communications or notices at the entrance. And you should bear in mind that some people don't have to wear a face covering, they are exempt. Nobody who is exempt from wearing a face covering should be denied entry if they're not wearing one. And we had some webinars yesterday for other, for other sectors. And the question that kept coming up is, do my customers need to provide any kind of proof of their exemption? There's no, there's no government scheme in place. There's no legal requirement for them to have any kind of exemption card. If somebody says they're exempt, you have to take it face value, they're exempt and they can enter your premises without wearing a face covering. And now we're talking about um, staff. So face coverings must be worn by hospitality staff in any indoor area that is open to the public or where they're likely to come in contact with, the member, with a member of the public unless they have an exemption. So if your staff are working in the kitchen, that area is not open to the public, so they, they don't need to legally wear a face covering there. But in areas where there are customers, they'll, they will need to legally wear a face covering unless they have an exemption. Where face coverings are required for staff, businesses are expected to provide these as part of their health and safety obligations. But if staff wish to use their own face coverings, they can do that as well. 
um, if you have taken steps to create a physical barrier or screen between workers and members of the public, then staff working behind that barrier or screen will not be required to wear a face covering. So I think when you go and do your weekly shop at Sainsbury's or Tesco or any other supermarket, a lot of the checkout, checkout staff are working behind a barrier or screen. So those working behind that barrier or screen are not legally required to wear a face covering. And uh, as we look to open on the 12th of April, um, a lot of you will be working outside. So that legal requirement to wear a face covering only applies in indoor areas, not outdoor areas. But however, we think it's still good practice for staff to continue wearing face coverings whilst working in outdoor areas to prevent them from frequently touching their masks when they're moving from indoor to outdoor areas. Um, and this is another question that's come up a lot. Can I wear a face visor or shield instead of a face covering? And the answer is no. Um, a, face cover, a face visor or shield may be worn in addition to a face covering, but not instead of one. This is because face visors or shield, shields do not adequately cover the nose and mouth and do not filter airborne particles. And um, now we're talking about staff who are exempt from wearing a face covering. If staff are exempt from wearing a face covering, if they feel comfortable doing so and are able to, they should wear a face visor slash shield. Um, they may wish to wear a badge advising customers that they're exempt. Um, this badge would make the customer probably more, feel more comfortable and also prevent yourselves as a business and us as the regulators from getting a lot of complaints. Um, and also if staff are exempt, this, this is something you should identify in your risk assessment, but they should not be working in customer facing roles. Um, and instead, where possible, work in back of house roles or behind a barrier or screen. So I'd like to go back to the supermarket example here. Um, so if you think of the self checkout area, there's usually a member of staff working there. And um, so that member of staff, um, somebody who is exempt from wearing a face covering should not be working in that area because it's open to the public and there's no barrier or screen for them to work behind. Instead, they should be working maybe in the in the back of the house, in the warehouse or they should be working at the checkouts or any other kind of counter where there is a screen or barrier that they can work behind. So social distancing again, we've had a lot of questions. Do these two meter rules still apply? Is it two meters? Is it one meters? So what the distance you need to maintain is two, dis two meter distance between individuals. Where two meters is not viable for your business, this distance can be re reduced to one meter but you must have further risk mitigation measures in place. Examples of risk mitigation measures include further increasing the frequency of hand washing and surface cleaning, keeping the activity time as involved as short as possible, using screens or barriers to separate people from each other, using back to back or side to side working slash seating where possible. And this applies for staff, which is reducing the number of people each person has contact with by using fixed teams and partnering. So I'll go through that um, in more detail in another slide. You should use floor, mar floor markings and signage to promote social distancing. And then also we had a, another question about the, do I still need to have this distance between the table? Is it two metres? Is it one metres? So the law which I've quoted at the above says businesses must ensure and it's written in red there, an appropriate distance is maintained between tables occupied by different qualifying groups. So from the 12th, a qualifying group would be um, a group of two households or a group of six people from any number of households. And then the, the legislation then goes on to define appropriate distance, which is two metres or one metre, and then talks about the risk mitigation measures in place. So distance between tables, just to cover it briefly, two metres or one metre plus risk mitigation, for example, and um, you've got them side to side or you've got screens and barriers in between. Next slide is cleaning. So this is to control the foamite transmissions. That's um, what I discussed earlier. So if I was to, if I was say infected and I was, I coughed and sneezed on a table, um, you want to ensure that the tables are being cleaned after each use. And um, so ensure you're cleaning the tables and chairs after each use including your condiment bottles provided to the table or you should you should continue using disposable disposable condiment sachets menus should be cleaned after each use and if they cannot be cleaned so they're not laminated they should be single use and any unused cutlery etc should be cleaned also when thinking about cleaning alongside the tables you should be thinking about what we call frequently touched surfaces so this would be door handles toilet flush handles taps 
tops, card machines, any handrails, anything like that. And then I just missed the point at the beginning of this slide, which is ensure you have hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer available throughout the premises for customers and staff to use, in particular at the entrance and near hand contact surfaces, for example, next to the toilet door. And you also may wish to give staff their own personal hand sanitizers so they can be frequently san sanitizing their hands. Just have a quick drink. So managing staff. So alongside ensuring customers are maintaining social distancing guidelines, you should make sure staff are as well and throughout the premises, not just when they're working. They need to be reminded that in break rooms, canteens, changing rooms, etc., social distancing rules still apply. And also all the other control measures still apply. So you should be you should as a business ensure that these areas are being cleaned and are well ventilated. Um, I also talked about fixed teams and partnering briefly. So this, when you're creating your rotors, etc., cetera, um, this would mean each staff member should work with the same few individuals on every shift. So for example, if I was a chef, or, although I don't have the cooking skills to be a chef, if I was a chef um, and I worked, every time I'd come on my shift, so say if I was working Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, next week, when I'm coming on my shift every day in the kitchen, I'll be working with the same other chefs and porters, etc., in the kitchen. And then finally, oh, minimising contact between front of house workers and customers at points of service where appropriate. So, for example, using screens or tables and tilt and tables to maintain social distancing guidelines. And um, so now going on to supporting the NHS test and trace response. So this is mainly QR codes. So you should all have um, the, the poster which is pictured you should have this from pre-lockdown if you have misplaced or or you want to print a new one or you want to print more um you should you can go online and create your um coronavirus nhs qr code for your venue and display it and it's a legal requirement for you to display um a qr code at your premises and then and then after displaying the qr code what else do i need to do so you need to ask every customer or visitor age 16 and over to scan um, the QR code. If for any reason a customer cannot scan the QR code, so for example, their battery might have died, they don't have the app or they don't have a smartphone in general, you should have an, you should have an alternative method to collect people's contact details which doesn't require a smartphone. So you, you might want them to fill out a, a slip which you keep in a folder or you might have a, a log book keeping all these details. The details you need to record are the name of the customer or visitor, a contact phone number for each customer or visitor, the date of the visit, the arrival time, and if if and where possible, the departure time. On top of that, for, that's for your customers and visitors, you should keep a record of all staff working at the premises and shift times on a given day and their contact details. All these details, all these details I've just spoke about, so um, you writing down the customer details if they don't have a smartphone to scan the app, or, and your staff um, working patterns. These details must be kept for 21 days and provided to NHS Test and Trace if requested. Um, if asked by NHS Test and Trace to provide these details, it's your legal duty to share this information. Um, and if, if, you are asking, if you are asked and you do not have this information, you'll be liable to pay a £1,000 fine. Um, if customers scan, scan in using the app, once they've scanned in, the NHS Test and Trace can access that data. The only data you need to provide is for the people who don't have a smartphone and you've manually written their, their details and for your staff. Um, hospitality venues also have an additional requirement. So if somebody has refused to scan the QR code and then refused to provide you with their details, you must take reasonable steps to refuse entry to anyone who refuses to participate. And then at the bottom of the slide in bold is an important change. So previously, pre-lockdown, um, if I was coming, um, if I was going with a group of my five friends, the six of us were coming to your business to eat or drink, um, there was a lead member provision. So only one of us would need to provide our details and then they would be the lead member and they would represent the group. That no longer applies. And every person over the age of 16 must be asked to scan the NHS QR code or provide their contact details. So if you have a family that have come in, all the adults or the over 16s of the family would need to um, scan the NHS QR code or provide their contact details. Um, this is just a fact sheet which 
covers in brief what I've just covered for you to refer to when um, looking through the slides, if you do. Um, and this is just a, a good practice. So we're talking while we're on the topic of the QR code, it's good practice to have a member of staff working at the entrance, welcoming customers, checking they do not have any symptoms of COVID-19, advising them of the premises rules slash expected customer behaviour. So for example, we're, up, we're operating outside at the moment, but if you come in and use the toilet, this is the queue and please wear your face covering, things like that. Asking customers to scan the NHS QR code slash provide their details and sanitise their hands. And also it is good practice to introduce a one-way system where possible. So people exiting the premises will not pass people entering the premises. Um, and now we're moving on to testing. So the first test is PCR test. So this is for, this has been, we've all been aware of this for what, like touching a year now. So anybody with symptoms of COVID-19, so a high temperature and new continuous cough, cough, sorry, and a loss or change in their sense of smell or taste should go on the gov.uk website and get a COVID-19 test. They can go and get a um, test from a test centre or they can get a test test kit sent home and then post it back out. The test needs to be sent for laboratory testing and will receive and you will receive the result in 48 to 72 hours depending on how you've done the test. Um, but what is being more introduced now is what we call lap, rapid lateral flow tests. So you might have heard, heard of this a few months ago being introduced in care homes and schools but now it's become widely available for the for the entire for the entire public in England. Um, so what is lateral, lateral flow testing? So lateral flow testing is a fast and simple way to test people who do not have symptoms of COVID-19, but who still may be spreading the virus. This is another key difference between the PCR that I just talked about. So to have a PCR test, you would have to have symptoms of COVID-19, but to have um, a lateral flow test, you do not need to be experiencing symptoms to take the test. One in three people with COVID-19 do not experience any symptoms, may be spreading the virus unwittingly. So this is a good way to find those people and get them to self-isolate. Um, since rapid lateral flow testing was introduced, over 120,000 positive cases that would not have been found otherwise have already been identified. And, and that's with it not being available to the wider public. Um, yeah. The best known example of a lateral flow test is the home pregnancy test kit. So that just shows how quick it is and easy it is to read the results. Um, the results you can read the results within 30 minutes and you do not require a laboratory to process the test. Individuals who test positive must immediately self-isolate to avoid passing the virus onto others and order a confirmatory PCR test. So how can you get these tests for your business? So um, you can order rapid lateral flow tests to test employees with no coronavirus symptoms. The tests are entirely free of charge until the 30th of June 2021 but businesses must register for these test kits, by, test kits by the 12th of April 2021. So you've got until Monday to register. The link is um, in this slide. But if you want to if you want to just Google it after the webinar, just Google order coronavirus test kits for your employees and you'll be able to do so. To be eligible, your business has to be registered in England. Your employees cannot work from home. So that so for hospitality businesses, your employees can't work from home and you have to have more than 10 employees. Um, also, it is recommended that private sector employees offer their workforce who are on site and access to a minimum of two lateral flow tests a week. Um, so this workplace testing would apply if you had more than 10 employees. And you're probably thinking, what if I don't have 10 employees, then what, 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 what are my options? So you can go on to the Merton, Wandsworth or Richmond Council website and book staff can book a lateral flow test. And um, that's what we refer to as community testing. And also on Monday, the government announced that everyone in England would be eligible for weekly rapid flow tests from the 9th of April. So the exact links are going to become available tomorrow, but it'll be available somewhere on the gov.uk website. And you can order a pack of lateral flow tests to be delivered to your home, or you can collect a box from participating pharmacies and other council locations. So tomorrow you might wish to check your council website to see where you can collect them. Um, so that covers testing. So now we're going under step two of the roadmap. So what, what are the changes from the 12th of April 2021 for when we can open on Monday? So you can only open outdoor areas. Um, so 
for seating so outdoor areas or hospitality venues can reopen to serve customers in groups of up to six people or two households. These venues may allow customers in to use toilets, baby changing rooms or breastfeeding rooms located inside. If there is no other means of accessing an outdoor area, then customers can walk through indoor areas to access the outdoor areas. Um, and whilst they're walking through, unless they have an exemption, they should be wearing a face covering and you should make it clear that should, they should only be walking through the premises. They shouldn't be loitering in indoor areas or anything like that. So there also the, the rules also vary depending on if your business serves alcohol or does not serve alcohol. So premises that do not serve alcohol, customers are able to order and collect food and drink from the counter, but must con consume this food and drink while seated at a table. And if customers are purchasing food for takeaway, they can enter the premises to order and pay for their food and then, of course, take it home. Premises that do not serve alcohol. Um, no, sorry, premises that do serve alcohol, this is now, um, is at any premises serving alcohol, customers will be required to order, be served and eat and drink while seating, even if no alcohol is served. Customers cannot go to the bar or counter to order. You should take payment at the table or, to, or at any other outdoor location. If it is not possible to take payment outdoors, for example, due to a technical issue, you can take payments indoors as a last resort. If you need to take payment indoors, the customer should wear a face covering unless they have an exemption. You should ensure only one customer is indoors at any time for the purposes of making payment. And you should operate a tab system to ensure that customers do not need to make multiple indoor payments during their time at your venue. That you are no longer required to serve a substantial meal with alcohol. So customers can order alcohol alone if they wish to. The previous 10 p.m. curfew has now been removed. You are also now able to provide takeaway alcohol. Takeaway food and drink, including alcohol, must not be consumed on the premises or adjacent to the premises. You must make it clear that this is, this is for takeaway only. Customers purchasing food or alcohol for takeaway must not enter the premises to order or collect their takeaway. They should be collecting it from the door. And this is just covering toilets. So as I mentioned previously, you can open um, toilets and breastfeeding rooms etc inside your premises where possible to provide a source of ventilation keep the doors to the toilets open if you're unable to keep the doors open for privacy reasons ensure there is hand sanitizer available at the entrance to the toilet for customers to use before touching the door handles additionally keep the windows inside the toilets open to provide ventilation you also need to manage the queue to the toilets if possible encourage customers to queue outside in outdoor areas um, and this is also another key topic now which is outdoor shelters and marquees so this is the legislation on what you cannot have so if an area is considered to be enclosed or substantially enclosed and um, it would be considered to be indoors so it should be still closed for the moment in terms of providing seating etc so i've provided the, the legislation here so if you want to look at this slide or if you want to refer to the legislation you can but i'm not going to confuse it by telling you what's not allowed instead i'm going to go through what you can't what is allowed so this is just for your own reference if it does come up in the questions i'm happy to cover it again but i thought it'd be easier to, pre to prevent it becoming confusing just to say what is allowed so what what is considered outdoors so to be considered an outdoor shelter marquee or other structure you can have a roof and um, because of course you want to protect from the rain but at least 50 percent of the area of the walls need to be needs to be open at all time and this must be permanent openings in the wall a window slash door or passageway would not count as an opening so i've got a few examples to follow now so i've got this photograph of this tent so as you can see it's got it's got a a roof structure and it's got three clear walls and then you've got this um this fourth wall which is kind of it's not a permanent opening as you can see that the the plastic has just been um pinned to the side like curtains so it can easily be closed so that's not a permanent opening it's a passageway slash door so we wouldn't count that as an opening so, so really zero percent of this is open um even if this, these structures weren't there, these curtain-like structures, and it was a permanent opening, it's still, 
assuming all the walls are pretty much the same size, there's only only 25% of the wall space there is open, where you need to have at least 50% of the wall space open. So really, in this picture, two of the walls need to be completely missing for it to be um, viable. Um, I've seen these kind of igloo structures um, advertised a lot on social media, so I thought it'd be good for it to put a photograph of these. Um, as you can see, the only opening there is the door. And again, the door won't be counted when we're determining if 50% of the wall space is open. So again, this is, there's no, there's no, there's no, it's 100% um, enclosed. There's no really permanent opening in the wall space. Um, and this is something that is allowed. So as you can see, there's 100% of the wall space is open. You've just got your, your roof structure to protect from the rain. So that is allowed. And then next, again, you've got the, um, the roof structure which is allowed. And then in terms of your wall space at the back, you've got the brick wall. So that, that wall that wall you'd count as enclosed. But in terms of opening, you've got the whole front is open and the two sides. So that is more than 50% of the wall space there is open. Um, so if you want me to cover this again in the questions, because I know I know it's a um, it's a new area. We need to think a new area um, that's come up that's come that's come up now, and which you didn't have to deal with pre lockdown. Um, but when you when you are thinking about it, a lot of you are think, familiar with smoking shelters, etc. It's the same legislation. So if you could smoke in this area, then it's allowed. And if you can't smoke in this area, then it, it wouldn't be allowed. So just to cover smoking um, again quickly, um, if you're allowing smoking to take place in outdoor areas of your premises, you should have separate smoking and non-smoking areas. Um, clear no smoking signage should be displayed in the non-smoking areas. There should also be no ashtrays or similar receptacles um, in smoke free areas and there should be a two meter distance between non smoking and smoking areas wherever possible. And while we're kind of on the topic of this, um, shisha smoking or anything similar is still still prohibited. Venues are not allowed to provide shisha pipes or anything like that um, for use on the premises. I know we had a question about this, so I thought it'd be worthwhile quickly covering it. Um, wedding receptions, so from step two, which is from Monday, wedding receptions and celebrations can take place outside with up to 15 people. This should be in the form of a sit down meal um, and they may take place in any COVID secure ve outdoor venue that is permitted to open. So, for example, your pubs and restaurants are permitted to open so you can ha host a sit down meal for 15 people as a red wedding reception outside. So step that's all step two of the roadmap. So step three, which is, um, it will be confirmed close to the time, but it will commence no earlier than the 17th of May, 2021. The guidance on this is currently very limited um, and we'd expect more guidance to be released close to the time. The only information we do have at the moment is from the spring 2021 roadmap, which was, which was released in February. And this document says that when step three commences, indoor hospitality with no requirement for substantial meal to be served alongside alcoholic drinks and no curfew the requirement to order eat and drink while seated which is table service will remain in terms of the gathering limits there'll be a 30 person limit outdoor and the rule of six or two households indoors and that is subject to review um, so unfortunately I can't provide much information on that at the moment um, COVID secure signage. So there's a link to this sign on the government website. Um, it's all about making your customers feeling safe um, to coming back and showing them that you are taking measures to manage the risk of COVID-19 at your premises. So you can go online and if you feel you've taken all the five steps, so risk assessment, having cleaning, hand washing and hygiene procedures in place, then you can sign this and date it and put it on display at the front of your premises. There's no legal requirement or anything to do so. It's just something that you might wish to do. The guidance online, so the guidance on the gov.uk website, the link's here, and it's for restaurants, pubs, bars and takeaway services. Um, it's where I get most of my information from. It's a good place, it's a good document to refer to and it's updated regularly. It was actually only updated today with the information about being able to come inside um, to make a payment if there's, if there's technical issues, etc. Um, so I do, I do recommend that you referring to that document constantly if you've got any questions. Um, or, if, or if not, come into us. Um, toolkit, so it's on the Merton Council website. It's a toolkit for reopening the high street. 
you've got links to various guidance and signage etc um, that you might find useful and then um, support for businesses so financial support is not my area of expertise unfortunately I can just signpost you to the various council websites for you, where you can go and get more advice on the grants, loans, etc. And then I'm going to just pass it on to my colleague quickly, Russ Stevens, who's going to quickly talk about the Ask Angela scheme, and then we're going, we can move on to questions. Hi, thank you. Um, right, I know there's some people in this room that may recognise me. I was the police licensing officer at uh, Merton Wimbledon Police Station, uh, retired at Christmas and I've now just started working for Merton Council doing effectively doing the same job but um, Ask for Angela is a really important campaign we um, as, as a police officer got hold of this in 2016 um, it was created by Lincolnshire County Council and we were able to bring it down to London and with the support of Lincolnshire County Council full support of Merton um, London Borough of Merton and also Love Wimbledon um, Business Improvement District we were able to uh, launch a pilot scheme in Merton for this campaign. It's really basic, it's really simple, but it is vital. And we we need we need to hold on to this as well. Um, I know you guys have got so much going on with COVID and everything, but this is a time where it's particularly poignant. We must make sure that your customers are safe. We have to take responsibility um, for, uh, for the welfare of potentially vulnerable customers. Uh, ask for Angela is where uh, you put posters up in your toilets mainly, um, social, uh, put it over social medias. Your customer, you might have someone, um, maybe a female meeting a guy for the first time, feels uncomfortable on that date. We, we find with online dating, which has taken a resurgence um, recently, obviously, that people will get to know their potential date online like their best friends so they get to know them really well form a strong relationship but if they're meeting someone for the first time in a pub or, or in the garden of a pub it's still meeting the person for the first time and there are still massive risks involved in that so you might have someone having a touch of the seconds or feeling really uncomfortable with the person they're with they need to be able to go to the bar and discreetly ask for assistance this is a code word so if they were to ask for angela then your staff would know that this is a call for assistance and you take them to the end of the bar, maybe um, just somewhere a bit quieter and, and offer them help. Uh, and that might be that you um, ask a person who's pestering them to leave. You might assist this person to, to leave by another exit, call them a cab if it's more serious um, or if you think they really, uh, or if they, they are asking for help, you call the police. Um, my uh, yeah, my previous colleagues were trained in um, in this scheme as well. They will take you seriously if you just say, "Look, I've got someone here who just needs some assistance." It's about taking them taking them seriously. To be honest, we don't measure success of this scheme by how many people actually ask for Angela. Um, it may never happen, but it is a fact that this that a person coming into your uh, into your bar can ask for help, and they will be taken seriously. It falls also goes hand in hand with um, wave training, which was um, introduced uh, a couple of years ago by by the Metropolitan Police. This is welfare and vulnerability engagement, and this is where you have your staff looking out for potential opportun opportunities to intervene when someone needs assistance um, and there's um, this is all um, copyright free it's based around a couple of videos um, which we can send you links to and you watch the first video and it is a scenario of people in a bar or going out for, uh, for a night out and there are various people along during that evening that have an opportunity to intervene and stop the worst from happening and unfortunately I know this is a spoiler alert but unfortunately at the end of the video some really bad things happen um, and you have a female who's um, seriously sexually assaulted uh, you have a guy gets run over by, uh, by a car these situations or uh, well, this situation could have been different and the second video that you would play to your staff go through would show all those opportunities where you might have a friend might just um, look out for their friend and, and um, 
Or you might have a, uh, a door staff who doesn't let someone in or intervenes because they think someone is pestering someone else. There are many, many situations that um, or opportunities to intervene and it's really important that we all take responsibility for that and we look out for our customers. Uh, prior to COVID, I delivered uh, the presentation myself to a number of um, number of venues. I'm more than happy to do that again when the restrictions allow us to. Uh, I would obviously I would look for someone to host, so maybe a, 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 a one of your larger bars, um, and we would invite other um, other people in, and we, I'd, I'd make that presentation to you. But like I said, it is also copyright free, and it was also it's designed to be handed out and given to everyone. So. Um, as it is at the moment, we'll get these videos out to you. Um, it's a full training package, there's training notes and everything. By all means, send it up to your head offices as well. And um, yeah, we would like you to introduce that into your uh, into your training. Um, yeah, I mentioned online dating. I mean, that's a it is a it's a big thing. Um, people will get to know each other. Uh, they meet in the first time. Uh, there's a lot of pent up, lot of obviously frustration with people that haven't been able to meet over the last few months or the last year. Um, and not just when they're online dating, but you are going to have people that maybe drinking to excess as well, meeting people that they haven't seen for a long time. Um, yeah, we, ne we need to be looking out for each other. Also, your staff turnover. Um, you may have received training in this previously, and uh, we've now got to think, well, all your staff as well. Everyone's concentrating on all the, the, all the many rules that we've now got to follow. We, we've still got to look out for your customers. Um, we've got to make sure that bad things don't happen to people. So... Cool. If anyone has any questions, or um, I'll, yeah, I'm certainly free to answer those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's now ready for the question, question, questions that anybody has. I'll start by going through the chat. Um, but if you do think of any queries post this webinar, or if your query is quite specific to your own venues, if you want to send a photo of your outdoor marquee or something like that, you can email us on food and safety at merton.gov.uk, and we'll be um, either myself or another another one of my colleagues will be happy to help. So I'll just start by working through the chat. Um, so I think some of the questions have been answered already. So will these slides be made available? Yes, they will be. Um, and is the event's being recorded. What indoor hospitality is currently allowed? Um, Yeah, no indoor hospitality is currently permitted. You should be providing no um, indoor seating or anything like that till step three commences, which is um, at, the, at the earliest, the 17th of May. Um, somebody's requested email me these guidelines for restaurants. Um, so you'll get a copy of this presentation, which all the links to have been, which all the links you can access. But just Google um, COVID-19 guidance gov.uk for pubs, bars and restaurants. And that's some really good guidance on there for you. Um, I have a garden at the back of the restaurant. Customer has to pass through the restaurant to sit in the garden. It, is it possible to open the garden from the 12th of April? Yep, yeah, it will be. Um, so just make sure that they're only passing through the indoor areas of the restaurant. They're not loitering in that area. They're just walking through and wearing a face covering unless they're exempt and then, and then enjoying their meal and ordering, etc. or in from the garden. Um, And then QR codes. Oh, it's just copying some of the guidance from there for you. Yep. Um. So the the igloo that has been referred to. That's as Helen said. It's deemed indoors. So at the earliest, um, seventeenth of May, you'd be able to use them. And there's just some more information from Love Wimbledon. Can I use the public parking in front of my restaurant to add more tables? So that would be a query for the street the street um street trading team. Is there anybody on the call from street trading? Um if not then um go on the relevant council's website, depending on what borough you're based in, um to find the um to find the street trading team's email address and just email them for some guidance on where you're allowed to if you're allowed to put tables outside your premises. Um, so we've got another question Ravina, here. Ravina, what, what borough is that person from? Can they... Um, could they confirm, please? That's Arthur Baker. I, I can unmute Arthur, so... Yeah, Arthur, perfect. I an invite to be unmuted. Yes. 
Hi, which borough are you from? We are from Wimbledon. Wimbledon. Yeah, just give us, Ravina said, give us, let us know, because we, if you want to use private land um, or if you wanted to use part of the high street, we just need to look at the individual location. It's, all, it's, it's going to depend very much on each individual set of circumstances, but we're happy to look into that for you. Okay. So if you just want to pop your details in the chat and somebody can get hold of you afterwards. Okay, I'll keep, keep my details in the chat. Okay, fab. Perfect. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, do we need to have customers scan the QR code and check in at the premises even if they're sitting outdoors? And the answer is yes. Um, all customers over the age of 16, whether they're sitting outdoors or from step three indoors, would need to um, scan the QR code. Um, so the next question is, hi, I have an electric roof for the garden. Can I open on the 12th of April? Um, so you can have a roof and then as long as, long as you're in the garden, more than 50% of the wall space is open, you can open. But if, if alongside that electric roof, you had um, four enclosed walls, that wouldn't be allowed. Um, it's a bit difficult to provide specific advice to a premises, but if you want to send some photos to food and safety at merton.gov.uk, we can look at that in a bit more detail for you. Um, the next question is, with people ordering takeaway alcohol, they need to pay outside but can they order via a person or does it need to be click and collect? Um, as far as I'm aware, it's not click and collect. You can still come to the door of a premises to um, to make your order and pay. You just should, they should, shouldn't be entering the premises. So you don't need to order it on an app or call in beforehand. Um, you can come to the door of a premises and, and order your takeaway, but you just shouldn't be coming inside the premises. Um, I think Helen or Tony from the licensing team will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and the next door, indoor hospitality after the 17th of May or later, do bartenders need to have a mask and visor or will a mask be enough? So in indoor premises, um, in areas that are open to members of the public, so for example, the bartenders will probably be in an area that's open to members of the public, they would be legally required to wear a face covering unless they're exempt. And in terms of the visor, they can wear one if they wish to. Um, but there's no legal requirement for them to wear a visor. Only re legal requirements to wear a face covering and less exempt. Um, and yeah, just that same question come up about takeaway alcohol. They need to be click and collect only. So there's no reference to click and collect. The only reference is they can't enter the premises. Um, so they can order and collect from the door. Um, the next question is on the door, we have a sign asking people to wear face masks. If they don't, if they don't we can't ask if they're exempt. So if you're, if somebody's, if I walk into your restaurant tomorrow not wearing a face covering, you can say to me, oh, um, excuse me, could you please put on your face covering? It's a legal requirement for you to do so. And if I turn around and say to you, I'm exempt, then you have to just um, believe that I'm exempt and let me into your restaurant or cafe or whatever business you have. You shouldn't refuse me entry for any reason. Um, but you can still ask the question. You can still ask challenge, like, well, I wouldn't use the word challenge, but you can still ask people to put a face covering on just like they are doing in the supermarkets at the moment but um and if, if they turn around and say they're exempt um you should um still allow them entry um so zoe has said if i open the whole front of the restaurant sliding doors could i sit tables just inside or do they, do they need to be totally outside so when i talked about the opening in the wall space these need to be permanent openings, so windows, doors, anything like that can't be counted. So unfortunately, even, even if you're sliding doors, even if you've got sliding doors, we can't count that as an opening, so it would be counted as a wall. Um, so unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to seat people in that area. But if I've misinterpreted your message or anything like that, if you want to send some pictures again, please send them to foodandsafety at merton.gov.uk and we can look at that you we can look into that for you in more detail. Um, somebody has said I've had a custom, couple of customers saying they have an app to show exemption. So yeah, they might have, there is various kind of voluntary schemes. Some people wear a sunflower lanyard or a sunflower badge, um, but there's no legal requirement for people to prove their, that they're exemption. So if people say they're exempt, you have to just um, believe that they're exempt. You don't, you can't ask for any kind of proof. Um, do the social distancing rules for where we place tables apply even if they're outdoors? Yeah, that's correct. So even if you're outdoors, you should still be having a two metre distance between tables or a one metre one meter distance plus further risk mitigation. But then one of your risk mitigation measures could be that you're outside, it's a well ventilated 
area um, alongside other risk mitigation you've got in place. Um, and then oh, that's just a message about recruitment of staff. Oh, somebody said that I seem to be muted. I'll try and move this mic close to my to my face. Sorry about that. Um, would a customer waiting for a takeaway need to check in or as they exempt as they're not seated? Um, so I think it's just customers who are coming into your restaurant or cafe or bar to sit down would need to check in. So, for example, if I go into um, McDonald's at the moment to get my takeaway, I'm, I'm not required to check in. So it's just customers that are are coming in and seat and, and sitting down. I mean, if a customer wishes to scan it, they can do if they're getting a takeaway, but there's no requirement for them to do so. Um, in December, a Wands of Marshall came to me. Yeah, so just to confirm, face covering is a legal requirement. A face visor is just an, um, an additional measure and which they can choose to wear, but the, the legal requirement is to wear a face covering. Um, what exactly is meant by adjacent to the premises? Is it across? Oh, this is for one of the licensing teams. So um, the question is, what exactly is meant by adjacent to the premises? Is it across slash down the road away from the venue? OK. Oh, I think Helen's already answered that. Sorry, in the chat. Um, so just to confirm for anybody who can't see the chat, adjacent can mean over the road areas usually frequently used by customers are deemed to be part of the premises. Um, so I think that's all the questions in the chat that have been covered. Um, has anybody got their hand raised? I've... No, Eleanor, if I can't see anybody, correct me if I'm no, wrong. No one else has got their hands raised. If anyone else has got a question, if they would like to raise their virtual hand now. Otherwise, we're done with the questions. <laughs> Perfect. If nobody raises their hand, then um, as I pre predominantly cover the Wandsworth area, but I do work in Richmond and Wandsworth as well. And oh, sorry. I offer... sorry, there was a question earlier on, and I think the lady has just um, re-asked her question. I'm just trying to find it. It was Helen from Love Wimbledon asked, many businesses completed the COVID statement previously. Do you recommend this is refreshed or the previous version is still appropriate? Um, Although I thought these were a legal requirement to be displayed. So the COVID secure poster that I referred to is it's not a legal requirement. Um, so if a business wants to use their old poster, they can do, or if they want to refresh it to show businesses that they've um, reviewed their procedures and are all up to date with the new guidance, etc., then they can do so. Um, but there's no legal requirement to display. It's just a, um, it's just about making customers feel more comfortable, really. Um, but. If there's no other questions then then please if you think of anything or if you have got any specific um requirements specific queries about your premises so for example your about your own outdoor structures then please email us at, us at food and safety at merton.gov.uk uh, we are all just here to help you um help you understand the guidance and everything that's come in place but yeah i think that's all then for today thank you very much